Thank you. A couple points right off the top. I'm from Ajax. I've heard people being from Mississauga and Halton, but there are people from Durham here, and I'm one of them. <laughs> Second part is, on this panel, there are no politicians. We get no speeches on budgets. <laughs> Let me introduce the panel to you. There's short bios in, in your uh, briefing books. Sarah Blackstock is a young leader from the nonprofit sector. She has a major interest in decent jobs and decent affordable housing or the lack of it and the impact it has on the lives of workers and children and seniors. Currently, Sarah is Director of Communications for Unifor and is former Director of Advocacy and Communications at the YWCA in Toronto. She was also one of Civic Action's Diverse City Fellows in 2013-2014. Beside her is Dr. Kwame McKenzie, the Chief Executive Officer for the Wellesley Institute. And he's an international expert on social causes of mental illness, suicide, and the development of effective, equitable health systems. And he's worked for more than two decades to identify the causes of mental health particularly in cross-cultural health. He's a physician, a psychiatrist, a researcher, and a policy advisor. He's medical director at CAMH. He's a full professor at the University of Toronto. And in his spare time, he's president of the Canadian Mental Health Association. Michelle DeManuel is president and chief executive officer of Trillium Health Partners. Trillium is a three hospital group comprising the Credit Valley Hospital, Mississauga Hospital, and Queensway Health Center serving the diverse communities of Mississauga, Halton Peel region, and West Toronto, but not Ajax. Michelle has spent her career in senior positions in both the public and private sectors, including a term as Assistant Deputy Minister of Health, leading large-scale change and cultural transformation. And she has a huge interest in childhood health and equity and the importance of the first 1,000 days. Rupert Duchesne brings a private sector perspective to this panel. Rupert is Group Chief Executive of AMNIA, a global leader in loyalty program management, and he previously held senior positions with Air Canada. He holds both an MBA and a Bachelor of Honours degree in pharmacology. Sort of a weird combination, but... He's also chair of the board of Neuroscience Canada Partnership, which is responsible for developing and implementing and monitoring a national brain research program. And he is also chair of the board of Brain Canada Foundation, which focuses on raising funds for brain research. Rupert is an advocate of private-public collaboration and has strong views, he tells me, on infrastructure deficit, especially for transit and affordable housing. Let me just explain what we're going to do for the next 35 minutes or so. We're going to have a conversation up here on the issues, on these five themes. And at the end, I'm going to take questions from the floor. I'll take questions. They'll answer them. Uh, so if you think of something, this is, we want it to be as, as interactive as we can. We want you to be thinking about these issues as we go along. We want to try to think of the case for change. Why is it important to take action? And think of aspirational wishes for this region. So my first question, in no particular order, goes to Dr. McKenzie. Your field is mental health. Um, and there's a growing need for mental health supports, particularly among seniors and particularly in the workplace. You want to describe um, how you think all these themes are interconnected when it comes to mental health in the workplace and how it deals with seniors. Okay, so thank you very much and thanks everybody for uh, being here today. Um, I'd probably dial back a little bit and talk about uh, preventing mental health problems uh, because I think that um, what we're really talking about here is people and how we look after people. I mean, 
people are the raw materials of, uh, of uh, Toronto. And when I think of mental health, uh, I think of the ability for people to prosper. And, and I think of a, an idea of mental capital. And this isn't just your mental health. This is your IQ, so your smarts, your EQ, so your uh, emotional intelligence, and then your mental health on top of it. And that, I think, is really important because those are the resources we need to move forward as a society. We're not going to out-manufacture too many people uh, in Toronto. We've got people, and it's our people smarts that's going to help us move into the, uh, into the uh, move forward economically. And if it's capital, and if you think about these things as capital, then the question is how you invest in it. If you don't invest in it, if you don't curate it, if you don't look after it, you lose it. And if you lose it, we all lose. And so I'm really interested in uh, mental health that way. So whether it's your first thousand days, which is all about building your resilience to be able to move forward, whether it's mental health in the workforce, which is actually, in my mind, about uh, industrial resilience to look after its own raw materials, or whether it's about how we look after our seniors and whether we uh, get access to green space, which actually builds our brain. Uh, it's all about curating and developing and allowing us to flourish as, a psych as psychologically sort of well people. So that's how I think of mental health. I don't want to actually, I'm a lazy doctor, right? I don't want to see people coming in to get treated for depression. I want to prevent people from becoming depressed and I want to see people flourish. So I want to go upstream and see how we build a community that allows that to happen. Michelle, when it comes to health issues and, and how they impact on children, especially in that first 1,000 days, um, do you see inter how these themes are all interrelated, interconnected? So uh, I guess let me first start by just giving you a context, uh, and, and I see a few of my colleagues from uh, the healthcare sector, particularly acute care, uh, our hospital sees 272,000 patients a year through urgent and emergent care. And um, there's no doubt that uh, in some ways we're not just a hospital. And, and our mayor talked about the fact that today at, at our hospital we have about 110 patients in our hospital who are waiting there because they can't get appropriate housing or some assistance to go back to where they were. And in our hospital this year we'll have 9,000 babies born. And so if you think of the course rod of the next four years, that's a lot of babies. And when you think about the first 1,000 days, and then you interconnect that all the way through the lifespan, we have an opportunity right at the front end on the very first day we know that there will be a life coming into our life to begin to affect change. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. It uh, is easily accessed through effective information. Uh, we have definitely parts of our community, and again, I think many of our speakers talked about those who are maybe looking inward, who we need to invite inward, and having much more permeable services that they can access in those early days, because we know if we get to those first thousand days, we know that it makes a difference. And I think one of the things the speakers didn't talk about, and I just want to reference this, is every single issue that we are talking about today every one of us could probably go and pull 10 or 15 reports that have been written about them. And no greater truth is that than in the first thousand days. 25 years ago, we were writing about the determinants of health, those first early days of childhood, and what a difference it would make. And we didn't take action. Because today, child obesity is at an epidemic. And we talked about a little bit about Toronto. The mayor talked about Toronto and, and needing public spaces for people to have recreation and, and their family rooms and their backyards. But you can still walk to many of those places in Toronto and you can still access transit in many ways. I was born in this city. I grew up in this city. I've worked in Hamilton. I work in Mississauga. I live in Oakville. And I'm heading to Durham soon. 
However, in some of those other communities, we don't have those spaces that are accessible in the way that they are in some communities. And so I just draw that, uh, that parallel as well. There's no doubt the public use of space affects early development. The use of our infrastructure and how we plan for that can affect health throughout. And we know that if we get the front end right, that as we are working with our aging population, we will see less and less of that population having to rely on hospitals as the first and last court of resort. And that is no truer than in mental health, as you know, where so many of our, our uh, community members have no place to go because the interconnectedness of our spaces and our services are just not there. And so people are often in crisis on day one. All of these are connected, but it all starts at birth, and we have an opportunity to change the channel today and in the next four years, because some of these issues will take many more years to come. Okay, thank you. Sarah, you're, you believe that decent jobs, decent housing is the key to uh, the interconnectedness of all these issues. Do you want to explain what you mean by that? Sure. It, it really is striking to think about how jobs affect all of these issues. We have, um, we were just hearing about the importance of preventing mental health problems. And increasingly, we find that uh, if you're in a low wage, precarious job, you're stressed out. And that's going to have an impact on your mental health. So it's not just about accommodating mental health. It's thinking about how we prevent those mental health problems in the first place. We're talking about the uh, importance of that first 1,000 days. I'm a mom to two kids, and I am, have a pretty decent job, a stable job. But while I was pregnant, I, I, I knew I was going to have a, a decent mat leave. And still, I was a wreck. And many people will tell you, I still am a bit of a wreck. Um, <laughs> but you think about what it means for those first 1,000 days. If you have a mom who's struggling numerous jobs, wondering how she's going to pay the rent, that has a profound impact on not just those 1,000 days, but the rest of a child's life as well. Even as we talk about affordable housing, obviously, uh, we have an aging population. Uh, but we also have the problem that the state of jobs is declining. We have more people uh, with low wages, without a pension, without retirement security. So again, we're thinking about this affordable housing problem. And there's an opportunity for us to think about the role of good jobs in dealing with this. I was heartened um, to hear Premier Wynne you know, talk about infrastructure. And one of the big, there's a huge opportunity to build the infrastructure we need and to create good jobs uh, in the course. So I think jobs is part of the problem, but also part of the solution. And I think in, you know, in a space like this where we have a range of voices, a range of people who are interested in having a deep conversation, there's an opportunity for us to talk about what would it mean if in Toronto we uh, had a more substantial debate about the kinds of jobs we want and had corporations and other employers make some commitments about the kinds of jobs that we're going to provide to the people inside uh, the region. I was, um, as you were uh, talking about living in Ajax, I, I grew up in Oshawa and uh, the city slogan used to be uh, Oshawa, the city that motivates Canada. It's obviously no longer that, not just because GM um, has uh, diminished in size quite a bit, but uh, it's a, it was a recognition that having a strong labor market, having a community full of good jobs, had an impact not just in that city, but across the country. So I thought that was a, uh, an interesting reminder of what, what a good job means uh, for a community and for the country. Good. Thank you. When you're from Ajax, Oshawa was the big city. <laughs> Rupert, infrastructure. You told me that Toronto is way behind on transportation and that our attitudes towards infrastructure and transit is woefully lacking. That's always. Do, uh, do you really yeah. believe that? <laughs> yeah, so look, I, I, you know, first of all, you know, infrastructure gets tend to let. Le left to last, and here I am, the last of the panelists to make a comment, which I think says something, but in fact, on my table, uh, somebody was saying that, uh, you know, infrastructure is 
the boring but the necessary uh, ingredient, and I think it is. If you're going to solve many of the problems we're talking about today, if you want uh, a young mother to be able to access daycare or a social environment for support, if you, uh, if you want inner city parks for people to uh, play, exercise, or pass time in, infrastructure is about all of these things. The impact of mental health on our society overall is really well known. Uh, it's substantially more than the impact of cardiovascular uh, disease or cancer. But without the infrastructure, whether that's the hospitals or the open spaces or the, the, the centers where people can go, you know, without that infrastructure, nothing's going to happen. On transportation in particular, I think we suffer from a slightly North American disease. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I wasn't born here. I'm one of the 51% of the, of the city's residents who wasn't born in Canada. But you look at what great cities around the world, both traditional cities like Munich or uh, cities like uh, Dubai or Shanghai have done with their transportation infrastructure. And the degree of friction that's taken out of people's lives and the amount of space that isn't needed for roads and parking, I think the transportation uh, element is really crucial here. And you know, look at a city, a very traditional city like Boston, took a really big bet and dealt with a very substantial portion of the infrastructure challenge. I think that the, the issue for us, and as you said at the beginning, I'm this weird combination of a businesswoman and a neuroscientist, um, it's, around, it's around the data. I think if we take decisions on where to put infrastructure and how to build it, and particularly transportation infrastructure, on the basis of the data that we have, and you were talking about reams of studies, and there's reams of studies on infrastructure, and particularly transportation. And we do that in a thoughtful, long-term way, understanding where the traffic patterns are, where the demand is, how we move people around the city, as well as in and out of the city. I think we'll take away an enormous amount of the friction here. And we seem to take transportation decisions based on, uh, certainly in some areas, on, on the votes available, in particular ridings. We, we do not have, uh, I think it was illustrated this morning, a great partnership between the federal, the provincial, and the city level. The, prov the province and the city are starting to work really well together. We need the same uh, at the federal level, because these are massive projects, billions of dollars, 10, 20, 30 uh, year time horizons, and we need to start using the knowledge we already have, the data we have, to build that infrastructure, and that will go a long way to facilitating the solving of some of the other issues that are on the agenda for today. Dr. McKenzie, you spoke about, to me, uh, the need for green spaces. Plant a tree together, you told me. Yeah. How does that impact on health, and how does that impact on mental health? Well, there is actually this huge literature on the importance of green space. Uh, uh, for any of you who are married, uh, uh, spending time in green space or having green space or uh, being a part of, uh, you know, uh, spending more time together in green space uh, increases your chance of staying together, uh, uh, increases your chance of dealing with uh, life's difficulties, uh, and means that you're more likely to stay married for longer. For kids, access to green space, planting trees, uh, things like that, actually increase your uh, brain power. So they actually help your cognitive development. Green space seems to be really important to us, and not just because it gives us an opportunity for fitness. So there's loads and loads and loads of uh, evidence out there showing the importance of green space. And that I was so taken by it um, that I decided to invest in farmland. And so every weekend, I love the city, and I enjoy the city. And every weekend, I go to the other side of Durham, and I sit on a farm, and I just feel my brain getting bigger. OK, well, <laughs> no, hey, maybe, maybe <laughs> not. <laughs> but, I feel, but I come back to the city every Monday feeling renewed and ready to um, do the 150 jobs that you uh, alluded to in the bio. OK. Sarah? The, the whole issue of affordability of housing and green space obviously impacts uh, uh, a lot of people in the city who can't get out to farmlands and so on. Do you see this as a major problem in this, in this area, in, in, from Hamilton to onward? 
Well, I think uh, you know we ha we already were talking about that when we when affordable housing is being built, that increasingly there there is conversations between builders and the people who are going to live in the housing about the kind of space uh, that they want. We are seeing a huge revitalization of Regent Park. Um, when I was at YWCA Toronto, we built the first or the largest affordable housing to be built anywhere in Canada in a decade, which is on one hand something to be very proud of, but on the other, it's kind of pathetic because it was 300 units of housing. But very important to that was a big green space, including um, a children's area so that the families could come out, get to know each other, and, and you know, build the kinds of relationships that we needed uh, for, the, for the community also to thrive. Okay, Michelle, um, traffic, commuting out in Mississauga from downtown Toronto where you one time worked must be adding to the stress, must be adding to issues of health and so on. Um, do you see a way around it? I mean, other than building subways to everywhere. Well, you know, I think, uh, I think the mayor spoke about the interconnectivity. So it is taking our existing assets and our, our existing investments that we've made and actually connecting them together, which in itself uh, I think can can start to I think relieve those irritants and those frustrations. Um, you know I, I think we all live in fear if you don't live in the downtown core of a Raptors game and a you know a baseball game and if the Leafs are ever in the cup uh, a hockey game all in the same season or in the same time period because getting into the city or out of the city is very difficult. And and the more you talk to people. Uh, the more that it's it's having you know a, a multiple effect. It's not just the the stresses uh, around um, uh, work. It's the stresses uh, in healthcare even to get into uh, you know higher levels of services that you may need that are in uh, very specialized centers. It's the economic impact. I remember talking to Gail Nyberg who talked about the added impact of traffic. Uh, their offices are in the Etobicoke area and the added amount of cost just to get food at the food bank to the families that are needed and here we are spending it on issues because it takes the trucks longer to get to uh, where they need to be than it used to you know five and ten years ago and so you know the impact of traffic has just a multi-dimensional piece and and I think again uh, you know that concept of we, we're, you know almost we've outlived in some ways the concept of building a better city we're talking about building a, a better region and, and really building, I think Helen and I were talking about, just that interconnected sense of community and communities within communities. And, um, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, the, con the connectivity of this country relied on a highway. And so much of that connectivity now has really come down to, uh, I think, two different kinds of highways. One is just the, the basic road and infrastructure and transit structure we have, which you talked about but also that information highway that we also access that uh, allows for a level of inclusion that I'm not sure we've leveraged either. Okay. Rupert, putting on your other hat, um, you talked to me about how business really doesn't recognize the importance of dealing with mental health in the workplace. And you said it's woefully under-acknowledged as an issue. Yeah, um, look, well, there's, some, there's some awesome, extraordinary companies uh, that are making real inroads. Obviously, you, you've got uh, Bell with the Let's Talk campaign and the really substantial focus on mental health. Uh, you've got RBC, you've, you've got TD, you've got others who are really focusing on this. But uh, the overall burden on the economy and on productivity is really substantial and it's still not acknowledged by the vast majority of businesses. In fact, and the smaller you go down the scale of business, the harder it is to deal with some of these issues. You know, for a, a company with 50,000 employees, you can put in place structured programs, you can make it work, you can, you can really focus on the, the hurt points. If you're running a small store with five employees and one of them goes sick with a mental health challenge or a neurological condition, it is really hard for you to cope, and there's very little support in that. So I think uh, if you know, corporations are very good at looking at every other source of revenue and cost, 
And I think this is the sort of the hidden gem in a, in a funny sort of way that, that needs addressing and it would improve the efficiency for, for everybody and make a real difference in the lives of the employees. But again, it's something that can't be done alone. I think partnership is a really important construct in all of the issues we're talking about here. Um, you know, we have one of the most extraordinary mental health institutes in the world here in Toronto with CAMH. Uh, talking about infrastructure, you only have to look at the transformation of their facility on Queen Street to see what the before and after should look like for many similar facilities around the world. Um, but it's only with partnership that I think we will solve some of these issues, because corporations uh, are quite divorced, I think, from the body politic in Canada generally compared to some other countries around the world. And they're going to need help to address these issues, both from the structured health system as well as, uh, as, well as from other sources. I have one quick question for all of you before I take questions from the audience. And I'll start with Michelle. Hopefully your microphone's working this time. That's good. This will give them enough time to run back and fix it again. So the question to all of you, and quickly, just because everyone's been asked to do the same sort of thing, is what is your aspirational wish for this region? So I, 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 it's twofold. Um, the first one is to think bifocally, and that is that we have to think about solving issues today while we also solve tomorrow's issues. It is really easy to become very myopic around what is around us. We have such an enormous responsibility to, uh, uh, to those who will come after us in, in making sure we deal with, with those issues. And, and the second thing is, and I think the Premier, uh, I'll, I'll tell a little secret amongst us 400 friends. Um, as the minister was, uh, Minister Rate was speaking, I saw the Premier jotting down some new notes. And I think uh, that as I was sort of peeking over, there were two words uh, that I saw her jot down. And it was the importance of um, taking out the competitive nature of so much of what happens uh, around what we do. And, um, and in, in, in having open debate and constructive debate, that she alluded to and, and not um, uh, getting into the we, they mentality. And I think if uh, one of the best things about civic action is when we leave, uh, we, we leave united around issues, that we are united to continue to debate, debate hard, but for the uh, outcome of building solutions, not a win-lose outcome. Okay. Dr. McKenzie, your uh, aspirational wish? My aspirational wish. Um, my aspirational wish is that both the Raptors and the Leafs uh, learn something from uh, what's happened this year. Um, because really, resilience is about learning from adversity and bouncing back. And I, we know that over the last 30 years, we've had a 50% increase in the number of people with mental health problems. We know that we've got a demographic shift, and so we're going to have um, move from 400,000 people over the age of 65 to 800,000 people over the age of 65 in the next 20 years. That's what's going to happen. Uh, we also know uh, that we're going to get more extreme weather, and we're going to have to deal with more floods, and floods increase your chances of having anxiety and depression. So we know all of that's going to happen. We also know there are going to be other challenges around the corner that we don't even know about. And the question for me, and sort of fitting into this idea of boot camp, is are we fit enough not just to meet the challenges, but to use them to springboard to a stronger Toronto? Uh, because that's what great cities do. They don't just meet the challenges, because I'm sure we're going to meet the challenges. They say, how can we use them to be even better? And so my aspiration is not to just be limited by the today or even the next five or 10 years, but to say, what do we need to do to get even further into the future and stay competitive and stay a wonderful place to live? Okay. Rupert, I won't leave you to the last this time. Thank you. Uh, I, I think my, my aspiration when I think about the city and the region uh, that we're in is, is equal access. I think you know, there are pockets of excellence and there are extraordinary projects around the city dealing with many of these issues. But if you could imagine that any, wherever you choose to live in this sort of 100 kilometer stretch, you have equal access to that quality of service, whether it's medical, mental, 
open space, housing, etc. That to me would be a great thing to aspire for because the city cities grow organically and we have a we have a significant period and a lot of investment dollars to try and create that outcome and uh, it's no good just pointing to the things that we do brilliantly in particular places we've got to aspire to have that right the way across the conurbation okay and sarah um well, I think one of my aspirations is for the kind of relationships and engagement that civic action has nourished over the last few years to become even richer, to become more robust, and that the conversations deepen and the, and the relationships become more substantial so that we can really push ourselves to um, try some, some uh, engage in very robust uh, campaigns. And specifically, I would like to see something around work. I'd like to see the folks around civic action and in this room make a commitment about what a good job, what decent work looks like in the region. So Mayor Tory was talking about his 10% challenge. There's no shortage of examples of living wage campaigns and campaigns where we look at the ratio of the CEO salary to the um, to the average salary of the worker, but I think it's time for us to have a very um, honest and heartfelt conversation about what is it going to take to create good jobs in this region, um, and that we're going to have to push each other uh, push each other out of our comfort zones a bit. Um, I, act, I do communications work, so I appreciate you know the benefit of a good spin, but uh, we need to. I think it needs to become a bit more substantial. And I think we have the potential to do it here. Thank you. So questions from the audience. We've got a chance for take two or three. And I, there's a question, there's a microphones and there's a question way back here. I'm sorry, the lights are. Hi everyone. My name is Jennifer. Thank you for uh, thank you to the panelists for that conversation. I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Um, just when thinking of these different issues, this is really loud. Wow. Um, when thinking of these different issues that we're going to be talking today in the different breakout sessions, and this one right here, because we're talking about interconnections, I really want people to think about, um, you know, what we're talking about is social justice, and something that hasn't been brought up is how do different people experience these things in different ways? Because not everybody experiences housing challenges or child, uh, childhood health or mental health in the same way. How does race and gender and ability and sexuality and class and all of these things, all of our intersecting identities play a role in our ability to access or not access the things that we're talking about today, right? When we're talking about affordable housing, who are the people that are really, that are live in social housing in this city and who are the ones that are on the waiting list? Uh, who are the people that live in the dilapidated low income high rises with abusive, predatory, harassing landlords? Um, you know, we need to talk about race. And as someone who was a diversity fellow a couple years ago, I'm really disappointed to see that out of 30 panelists, only five are racialized people. Only five are people of color. So when we're talking about um, diversifying, or the need for more diverse leaders and leadership in the city and the province, we need to act that, we need to live that. And when we're organizing these conferences and events, you need to be, you need to, practice what you preach, I guess. So um, this is just for everybody, not just the organizers, but you know, when we're talking about these discussions, when we walk into the room, look, how many people of color are in the room? How many women so, are on the panel? So that's something so, that I'd like so do, to So do you actually have a question for one of the panelists? No, no I, a I heard a couple, I'm, when I, they're when all I, good. I said I had a comment, not okay. a question. That's what I said in the introduction, yeah. So if anyone wants to like comment on, on my observations, that would be welcome. Yeah, okay, the, the couple people want to respond. Yeah, so first off, thank you for that question and, and for, for the comment because I think it's an important, one of the best things about civic action is all opinions welcome, all thoughts welcome, all advice welcome. And I think uh, you're standing up and, and starting out with something like that is, is just a testimony, uh, I think, to, uh, to the history of this organization. Um, but I, I'll, I'll speak as a hospital CEO quite specifically because I think the issue of access is an important one and as, access cannot just be measured in numbers and I think that's a, a fundamental uh, component to the principle of your point because these numbers have faces and they have experiences 
and some people start uh, in the starting blocks and they're ready to go, and some people have many weights placed upon them to be able to, to realize their full potential or, or to access those services. And, and I think one of the thing that, uh, things that certainly um, uh, both uh, my colleagues and I who run the acute care sector in, in, in this province are constantly thinking about is that access has many faces and many shapes and many forms, and it is something that we have to become exceptionally more agile at because um, it can mean very significant poor decision making and also um, difficulty in actually treating patients effectively. Or in the case of some of the things we've talked about with respect to mental health, getting in early enough and understanding how to put some of those supports around. But it speaks to the need for interconnectedness on these solutions because, uh, you know, just to give one a very small example, we have 100 patients that we're following through our health link, and the single biggest thing that is impacting their ability, we have a high immigrant population in our community, 58 languages spoken, it's affordable housing and their access to that, which is really impacting their health determinants. And so again, I just want to say thank you for that comment. Do you want to come? Yes, sure. Um, I guess my feeling is that uh, one of the biggest problems in Toronto at the moment is the increasing wealth gap between the outskirts of the city and the downtown. Uh, David Holchansky at the University of uh, Toronto produces a map, and this map shows three cities. Uh, downtown, about half a million people who've had a 20 to 40 percent increase in income over the last 30, uh, 30 years. Round that, city two, which has flatlined over that period of time, and round that, city three, which has been decreasing in income by 20 to 40 percent over the same period of time. And uh, his projections are that things are just going to get more and more uh, unequal. Uh, most of the children, over 50% of the children, if we're thinking about the first 1,000 days, mo more than 50% of the children in Toronto live in City 3, uh, and, live, and a third of those live in poverty. And they're marginalized and they're racialized. Uh, however, if you look at the parents in City 3, they're more likely to have a degree than people downtown. They get paid uh, about 20% of the same rates as people downtown. And we're getting wider and wider in uh, our income disparities. Now, whether you believe in social justice or not, whether you are conservative or liberal, the truth is the facts are very clear. The more unequal the city is, the more in effective a city is, the more waste there is, uh, the worse all of our outcomes are. If you're downtown or you're on the outskirts of town, you live shorter in an unequal city. So if we want to move forward economically on our health, on our mental health, we have to do something about equality. And basically, if we want to do well, uh, we can't leave people behind. Very simple, whether you've got a mental health problem, whether you're seniors, whether you're marginalized in any way, we can't leave people behind. And I can make a social justice argument, I can make a health argument, I can make an economic argument, but really, in the end, I just make a human argument. We just can't leave people behind if we're going to be a world-class city. Sorry, the organizers keep indicating that our time is up. I've talked to these four panelists. Uh, we had a long discussion before this event. And sitting here, I keep learning things. I have more questions to ask. And I find it fa fascinating the deeper you get into it. But, but as I said, unfortunately, the uh, organizers said it's time for lunch. So anyway, I want to thank the four panelists, Sarah Blackstock, Dr. Kwame McKenzie, Michelle Dumanuel, and Rupert, thank you very much for doing this. It's, I found it fascinating, and I hope you have too. Thank you. Thank you.